today at the National Press Club, Anthony Albanese, leader of the opposition. With just a few days left until the federal election, can the Labor leader unseat Scott Morrison to become the next Prime Minister of Australia? Anthony Albanese with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra and today's Westpac address. My name is Laura Tingle, I'm the club's president. Three more sleeps until polling day, and we bring you our last pre-election event. It is traditional for the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition to give their final major addresses of the campaign to the National Press Club and its large national television audience. Prime Minister Scott Morrison becomes the first Prime Minister in over 50 years to not give such an address. We wish him well on Saturday, as we do our speaker today, <laughs> Opposition Leader Anthony Albanese. Why is everybody laughing? Um, <clears throat> may the best man, or more importantly, the best policies win and govern Australia well for the next three years. It's been a long campaign, but governing is an even longer, more exhausting and more important challenge. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Albanese to address us today about how he plans to manage that challenge. Well, thanks very much, Laura, and I'm, I'm certainly pleased to be at the National Press Club uh, once again. I acknowledge the traditional owners and of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I proudly reiterate Labor's com commitment to implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. If an Australian government can take up the invitation First Nations people have extended to us, an invitation that is so generous it stands as an act of grace, it will help define our future as a more reconciled and more equal country. I thank all of my colleagues who are here today as well and I want to express my deep gratitude to all the other members and senators and candidates and our volunteers and supporters who are out there right now walking the talk, making calls, knocking on doors and handing out on pre-poll where people are voting in record numbers. Our democracy is a vital and precious institution and as events around the world keep reminding us, not something we should ever take for granted. I can promise you this, my team will be working hard for every single vote right up until the polls close at 6pm on Saturday. Our democracy draws its health and strength from people putting up their hand, engaging with their community, participating in the contest of ideas. I'm here at the National Press Club today to outline Labor's plan for a better future. I'm seeking the honour of serving as Prime Minister of the best country in the world. And I want to lead a government that is worthy of our great nation. A government that honours the values of the Australian people, that repays hard work, nourishes aspiration and creates opportunity. A government driven by strong and simple principles that you might have heard me mention during the last six weeks. No one held back, no one left behind. I began this campaign outlining Labor's plans to build a better future, to boost wages, to help with the cost of living, make things here in Australia, strengthen Medicare, fix aged care, invest in the skills of our people and bring our country together. As we near the end of this campaign, these promises remain central to Labor's vision for Australia. Scott Morrison started his campaign saying, you didn't have to like him, but at least you knew who he was. Five weeks later, he's saying he can pretend to be someone else if it will make you like him. <laughs> Labor is offering Australians a chance to change the country for the better. He's promising to change his personality. He's been the devil you know. He's been a bulldozer. He told us he's a car, just not an electric one, obviously. 
And now Scott Morrison, who's been in this government for nearly 10 years, is telling Australia that's not enough. He wants another term as Prime Minister, not because it's a great deal for you. He says to quote him, he's just warming up after four years. Seriously, four years as Prime Minister, he himself is distancing himself from Scott Morrison. What a concise concession of failure. But it's been like that all along. Labor's campaign is about the Australian people. Your values, your aspirations, the difference that a good government can make in your life. The Liberals' campaign is about them, their obsessions, their vendettas, their excuses, their political survival. But of course, elections aren't just an assessment of our campaigns. Australians are giving their verdict on the last three years and the last three terms. And more importantly, making a judgment about who is best to lead our country into the future. In 2022, that means looking at how we got through a once in a century pandemic and asking, what are we going to learn from it? Now, amid all the tragedy and uncertainty of COVID, which is of course still continuing, Australians have been simply magnificent, caring, brave, patient beyond measure, but it hasn't been easy. So many people have done it really tough. The crisis we came, we're going through showcased the strength of our community and once again what we saw was the worst of times bringing out the very best in Australians. But it also exposed the vulnerabilities in our economy, the uncertainty of insecure work, the unsustainable costs of childcare, the neglect of our skills and training system, the digital divide in access to the MBN for homes and small businesses, the pressure on our health system, but importantly, the pressure on our healthcare workers, the absolute crisis in aged care, and the risk to business and industry from our position at the end of global supply chains. These problems aren't new. Most are the inevitable end result of a decade of cuts, mismanagement, ne neglect, and a government that's just focused on itself. With the real world consequences felt by hardworking Australians, like today's news, that real wages have gone backwards yet again. A fall of 2.7%. What a hit. This delivers the biggest cuts to real wages in more than 20 years. Under Scott Morrison, real wages are plummeting while the costs of living are skyrocketing. Australian workers are paying the price for a decade of bad policy and economic failures while Scott Morrison says he should be rewarded with another three years because he's just getting started. The choice Australians have to make this Saturday is which party can be trusted to solve these problems. The Liberal government that created them, a Prime Minister who denied them and then blamed them on someone else, or a Labor Party driven by a determination to learn the lessons of the pandemic, to face up to the big challenges confronting our country and to bring people together to build a better future. If you needed any more proof that Scott Morrison is determined to learn nothing from the last three years, you only need to look at what he has said in the last week. Now, he started off the week by arguing that the workers who carried our economy through the pandemic. They went out to work, they risked their own health to serve others for $20.33 an hour. What did he say? They couldn't afford one extra dollar an hour. One dollar an hour. He believes they should get a real wage cut. And remember this, government said that low wages 
were a key feature of their economic architecture. It's not bad luck, it's bad policy that are leading to a decline in real wages and a decline in people's living standards. That's their idea. That is one thing they have delivered on. The Prime Minister finished the week by saying that working people should raid their super to fix Australia's housing crisis. So the Liberals believe you should lose one key asset in order to get another. With Labor and our plans, you keep both. The Prime Minister's most remarkable statement, though, was that his biggest flaw is that he's too quick to solve problems. <laughs> I'll just leave that hanging there for a bit <laughs> so you think about it. The bloke who said, when Australia was burning down, I don't hold a hose, mate. The bloke who said, when we were way back in the queue in the developed world or somewhere in the 90s about the rollout of vaccines, what was his response? It's not a race. And on every issue that you can think of, what's his response? That's not my job. His four favourite words. The only thing that Scott Morrison actually does quickly when there's a crisis is blame someone else. Well, the Liberals won't change, the Prime Minister can't change, and the only way to change Australia for the better is to change the government this Saturday. Learning the lessons of the pandemic run right through Labor's plans for the future. Our plan for more secure jobs and better pay, cheaper childcare, Jobs and Skills Australia, working with business to identify skills gaps and then connecting TAFE and training with good jobs and growing businesses, expanding access to the MBN, strengthening Medicare and making it easier for people to see a doctor, fixing the crisis in aged care, 24-7 nurses, more time to care, more accountability and better food. A national reconstruction fund to revitalise local manufacturing and see that Australia makes things here again. And our Powering Australia plan that seizes the opportunities of climate action to create jobs and boost industry. All of this is important, but more than that, it's also urgent. We simply can't afford three more years of the same. The challenges facing our country are here right now. Our economic competitors are reskilling and modernising now. There is a cost of living crisis now. Fair work and fair wages are under attack now. The security dynamic in our region is changing now. There is a crisis in aged care right now. Climate change is happening now. Australia simply cannot afford three more years of drift, three more years of more of the same, more of the same waste and rorts, drift and absolute failure. We need to change the government and we need to change the government now. Not just because of the irreversible damage that will be done by three more years of neglecting aged care or cuts to Medicare, not just because families can't afford three more years of everything going up except for their wages, but because there are opportunities that we have to grasp, reach out and grab them right now. Labor's plans for a better future are designed to fix the urgent problems facing our country. And our policies are about seizing the once in a generation opportunities that are right there before us. Take our Powering Australia plan. Making Australia a renewable energy superpower is the fastest way to cut pollution and the most effective way to act on climate change. But it's also the best way to cut power bills for families and businesses. It will save families $275 on average a year. Powering Australia will help protect Australia's precious natural environment for the next generation and it will create new jobs and new industries. Our plan to embrace clean energy will deliver 604,000 new jobs by 2030, 
Five out of every six of those will be in the regions. It will attract $52 billion of private sector investment. It will ensure that renewables are 82% of the national energy market by 2030. Importantly, importantly, we will end the climate wars. I don't know what it takes for this government to recognise what is happening out there. We've had the bushfires, we've had the floods. The intensity of these events has had a real impact, not just on our environment, but on people's lives, but also on our economy. But they just sit there and argue, Barnaby Joyce having right of veto over the whole show. We can't afford three more years of that. Importantly, our plan is about bringing people together, finding common ground to advance common interests. The how is just as important as the what, and the how in a government I lead will be about bringing people together. This policy is supported by the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group, the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the ACTU. I mention that diverse collection of supporters because I view our approach on powering Australia as a template for tackling the big challenges facing our country. On my first day as Labor leader back in 2019, I said that Australians have conflict fatigue. If they had it then, they have it even more now. And on climate, rather than rally the same troops to dig a deeper trench in the same spot, I wanted to find new allies. I wanted us to look for solutions, not arguments, because I believe the best way to achieve progress is to bring people together. That's the approach that I've taken throughout my political career. Have a look at what I did as Infrastructure Minister, creating Infrastructure Australia, bringing together a board with Rod Eddington and Ken Henry and Kerry Schott and Heather Ridout and others. Projects being assessed according to their merits and their economic value to productivity, not their political location. And that's the approach I want to take if I'm elected as Prime Minister. I want to look for solutions, not look for arguments and wedges. I want to work with all Premiers and Chief Ministers on how we can make the Federation more functional and more cooperative. I want to rebuild faith in the capacity of politics to find answers, not just start fights. Of course, rebuilding trust in politics also means demonstrating genuine accountability. And that's why a Labor government I lead will put forward legislation for a national anti-corruption commission before this year is over. And one of the first things I will do if I'm elected Prime Minister on Saturday is to bring business, employer groups and unions, civil society groups together in an employment summit here in Canberra to collaborate on secure work and ensure enterprise bargaining is working more effectively. Because bringing business and unions together at the enterprise bargaining table with productivity gains as a focal point is how we increase both profits and wages without adding to inflationary pressure. This is the fundamental economic challenge right now and we must view government, business, unions and employees as partners in tackling it. A Labor government would have a unique opportunity to restore the momentum that is already underway between the ACTU and COSBOA, making workplace relations for small businesses simpler and more accessible. In that spirit, a Labor government will consult with small business and unions in the lead up to our employment summit to identify and implement practical ways that the fair work system can be made simpler, fairer and easier for all parties. Small businesses are the engines of our economy and were some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. They need a government that supports them as they recover and grow. Promoting smooth workplace relations is one way that we can work together to enhance efficiency and productivity. We will aim to deliver outcomes through cooperation, acknowledging that the best answers usually come from the people directly involved. Working with small business, bringing people together is how a Labor government I lead 
We'll build an economy that's more resilient, more diversified, but importantly also more productive. And one of the key reforms that we will deliver, one that is low inflation, high productivity, and provides real cost of living relief, is of course the centrepiece of my first budget reply, cheaper childcare. Now our plan for cheaper childcare will deliver meaningful, ongoing relief for families struggling with cost of living. But as important and urgent as that saving for families is, the benefits of our ch cheaper childcare plan reach far beyond that. Reforming the childcare system is not welfare. It is economic reform. The childcare system currently acts as a disincentive for parents, especially mums, to return to full-time work. What sort of system says that if you work a fourth or a fifth day, you actually might lose money. It might cost you money. That costs those families, but it costs businesses as well because you don't have the career paths. It feeds right through to women's retirement incomes at the end of their working lives as well. Our plan will boost workforce participation and boost productivity. It's a clear cut way to grow the economy without adding to inflation. It is the single largest on budget commitment we are making at this election. And we've had it out there for three years. It will break down one of the biggest barriers to the full and equal participation of women in the economy. Through a decade of Liberal government, Australia has fallen to 70th in the world for women's economic participation and opportunity. And we have gone from being the 24th most equal country in the world for women and men, 24th to 50th. Not really a source of pride, is it? 24th to 50th under this government. Across the country, too many working women are underappreciated, underpaid and disrespected. A Labor government I lead will do everything in our power to change that, including implementing every single recommendation of the Respect at Work report and making pay equity an objective of the Fair Work Act. We will create expert panels for the care and community sector workforce, vital female dominated industries that have endured decades of low pay and poor conditions. Now Labor welcomes the decision by the Fair Work Commission that will grant millions of Australians access to 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave. Good on the union movement for taking that case. But a Labor government will introduce legislation in the next parliament to make 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave the law of the land. It should be an entitlement for everyone. <laughs> now, if Labor is successful uh, this Saturday, uh, we will inherit the worst set of books of any incoming government since Federation a trillion dollars of debt. This government has borrowed more, taxed more and spent more than Labor and delivered so much less. To build a better future, we need a better budget. Labor is committed to being responsible economic managers. We believe the quality of our investments matter. It's why the budget strategy that Jim Chalmers and Katie Gallagher outlined earlier in the campaign is so important. The Morrison government is the most wasteful since Federation. It's got worse. Its budget is absolutely riddled with rorts and weighed down with waste. Tens of billions of dollars of waste have been uncovered. Sports rorts, the uh, pork and ride scheme where you had car parks that were supposed to be for commuters, except there wasn't actually a train station there. On pandemic support for firms whose profits were actually increasing. On submarines that will never be built. That's why they don't have anywhere near enough to show for a trillion dollars in debt. A debt that they had doubled before the pandemic. 
before the pandemic. And it's why we'll target the waste and rorts in the Morrison government's budget. Now, I've said for some time that Labor's focus will be on quality investment. That's why we've targeted the areas that we have. They're targeted and responsible investments. They are a fraction of what the government has wasted. And it will all be about strengthening the economy, increasing productivity and supporting families. And I announced today that Labor will reduce the uncommitted funding in the Community Development Grants Program by $350 million and we will return the $400 million regionalisation fund back to the budget. These two decisions alone will repair the budget by three quarters of a billion dollars. Jim and Katie will have more to say about this tomorrow. But I want to be clear right here today. If I have the honour of serving as Prime Minister, it will be my mission and my responsibility to ensure that every dollar spent in the budget is used to drive the productivity growth we need to pay down Liberal debt and to deliver meaningful, quality of life improvements for all Australians. This announcement today is the start of repairing the budget and cleaning up the mess that we'll inherit if we're successful on Saturday. Now, I believe that Labor governments have always changed the country for the better. They build for the future. They shape the economy in the best interests of people. We celebrate the legacy of Medicare, universal superannuation and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. They are worthy of protection, not just because they are great Labor achievements. They're a lot more than that. They belong to our Australian identity now. They're a source of national pride. They speak for our character and our values as a nation. I want to write our agenda for childcare and aged care into this great national story. Because reliable, affordable and universal services arm people with the confidence to pursue their aspirations, to fulfil their potential and to strive for the best. Better care makes us a stronger country because it means that Australians can live better lives. I know the difference that a good government can make to people's aspirations. It's what's brought me here today in a position of standing for Prime Minister of this country. Good government changed my life. A good government helps people put a roof over their head. It supports young people who want to learn a trade or get a degree. A good government ensures older Australians can live out their later years with dignity and respect. A good government creates opportunities for families to get ahead and stay ahead and make sure they can get the health care and childcare they need when they need it. A good government gets wages rising, not going backwards. A good government backs businesses who are innovating and growing. A good government makes it possible for Australia to make things here again. A good government protects and defends our national security and strengthens our relationships with our allies by dealing with them honestly. A good government protects the natural wonders of our environment, treasures that we hold in trust for our grandchildren and future generations, and it invests and cherishes our universities and our arts and our sport and our music and the multicultural miracle of modern Australia, celebrating the diversity that gives us strength. A good government will grasp the opportunity that is there for healing and truth and reconciliation offered by the generous Uluru statement from the heart, that hand out just asking to be grasped and asking for good manners to be implemented. Good manners tell you when something you do has an impact on someone else, talk to them. That's all a voice is. Ask them and hear them and listen to them. Given our history since 1788, is that too much to ask? We need to celebrate the fact that we share a continent 
with the oldest continuous civilisation. This is the Labor government that I want to lead. This is the positive campaign that I have run. Not to occupy the space to change the country for the better. Honest, real, focused on the lives and values of the Australian people. That's how I started, that's how I intend to finish. Focusing on solutions, not arguments. Taking responsibility, treating people with respect. And that's what the job of being Prime Minister is all about. If the Australian people do me the extraordinary honour of making it my job, I'll do that job to the best of my capacity every single day. And the job will not be about me, but about the Australian people and how I serve them. Leading a Labor government that includes and empowers people to reach their potential. A Labor government that invests in Australia's skills, jobs, security and care. A Labor government that holds no one back and leaves no one behind. A Labor government that builds a better future. That is what I aim to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr Albanese. Um, if I could start uh, with something that Scott Morrison said at the beginning of the campaign, and which you've sort of referred to as well. He said this shouldn't be an election that's a referendum on the government. It's got to be a choice. Um, now, you're saying it's a choice too, but you've locked yourself in uh, in the interests of um, minimising the, the wedges on a whole range of issues, uh, from foreign policy to climate policy, but particularly on tax policy, um, you're going, you, you've endorsed the uh, uh, stage three tax cuts, which are worth billions and billions of dollars in a couple of years. So my question to you is, have you locked yourself in so significantly on a wide range of policies that you actually aren't in a position where you can deliver on what you say, which is that you want to change the country by changing the government? We will deliver on exactly what we are committing to over our first term. And one of the things that I've said uh, consistently is that I've been focused on uh, the uh, election day, but importantly, the election day after next. Why do I say that? Because I'm focused on what we will do in government, not just uh, trying to, to get there to change uh, who uh, lives in the, the, the ministerial wing, uh, but focused on achievable, ambitious projects going forward. And that's why we have been very responsible in the commitments we've put forward, given the extraordinary amount of uh, debt uh, that we will inherit if we're successful on Saturday. So all of the measures that we have, and uh, Katie and Jim, as I said in the speech, outlined uh, our plans uh, for growth and how you do that, our Powering Australia plan, our better infrastructure investment, including the MBN, our investment in skills, our investment in childcare, our investment in making more things here, will all grow the economy. They're all investments that will produce returns. And that is why we have concentrated on that agenda. Uh, the tax cuts are legislated. And one of the things also we've concentrated on is providing certainty about what the agenda looks like going forward because whether it's in climate or whether it be uh, the decisions that businesses will make about where their investments go or whether they be uh, individual family budgets, that certainty will provide a ballast going forward. And we have been very clear that we'll do exactly what I'm saying we will do over the next term. We do have a changed tax measure on multinationals of which will return a little bit under $1.9 billion, but that is a responsible commitment that we have made. David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Mr Albanese, for your speech. David Crow from The Age of Melbourne and from the Sydney Morning Herald. You've spoken about um, the vision that you have for the next term of parliament under a Labor government, and a lot of that is about 
building things in Australia and about local jobs. The key policy mechanism is the National Reconstruction Fund, which you want to have, which you want to build up with $15 billion, I take it, of borrowed money. Now, that's a lot of money for ministers and yourself to allocate. You're also running on a platform about integrity. So what can you tell Australians about the safeguards yeah. over that $15 billion? Will we see independent oversight of that money? Will we see the public release of any advice to you and your ministers about how that money is spent? Will they reveal reasons for allocating money to various projects around the country? And will there be a process to review the grants or the loans that this new entity would issue? Thanks, David. We'll be uh, completely transparent. And what we're doing, what we'll establish is essentially the model that has worked really effectively with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation model. So arm's length, arm's length. They won't be political decisions. They'll be decisions based upon a proper analysis of if, if you're a business, like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation has operated very effectively, in spite of the fact this government tried to abolish it, I think at least a couple of times, uh, if you have a business that's crying out for some support in order to uh, be able to mitigate risk, in order to ensure that it can grow and, and have new industries, uh, then uh, that will be a priority, but they won't be political decisions. We've also said in areas including uh, half uh, a, a billion dollars of that will be allocated for agriculture, others for new high tech, a uh, billion dollars, advanced manufacturing, three billion dollars, uh, looking at uh, green steel and green metals manufacturing connected uh, with renewables uh, as well, and a billion dollars from the resources sector. So take a practical example here. Uh, we produce lithium, nickel, copper, everything that goes into a battery that's going to power not just cars, but homes and businesses into the future in terms of battery storage. It is the game changer. Um, that is something that we should be investing in. There's a little company you've probably heard of called Tesla in the United States. Little company, going OK. Began with, essentially, what gave it the kickstart was support from the US government. And a government I lead will back Australian businesses to become powerhouses just as Tesla has become a global powerhouse. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from The Conversation. Mr Albanese, if you're elected on Saturday, you'll be at the Quad meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> Could you tell us as precisely as possible whether your message to the other leaders there would be one of Australian foreign policy uh, being a matter of continuity or would it be one of the changes that would come about under your government? And to the extent that there are changes or would be changes, can you tell us the areas? We will have, under a government I lead, three pillars of our foreign policy. The first is our alliance with the United States. The second is uh, more intense and deepen our regional relationships. And the third is support for multilateral forums as well. So there's an element of continuity throughout that. But it's also a matter of having trust as well. Uh, I won't leak text messages to international leaders. I will engage in an upfront way, in a mature way, and I look forward in particular uh, to some of the policy changes that we're putting forward, increasing our standing globally. We, we, are, we are in the naughty corner at UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conferences. That's the truth. That's the truth. We were there under Howard, we're there now. One of the ways that we increase our standing in the region, and in particular in the Pacific, is by taking climate change seriously. And the Biden administration and, and Australia, I think, will have a strengthened relationship in our common view about climate change and the opportunity that it represents. But a lot of our foreign policy in terms of the challenges uh, will remain completely consistent over areas like the strategic competition we're seeing in the region with the more aggressive response uh, of, of China. Uh, I expect uh, that, uh, well, I don't expect, uh, we will 
uh, maintain a, an absolute consistency uh, in that position of standing up for Australia's values. Thank you. Phil Curry. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. Hi, Mr Albanese. Phil Curry from the AFR. You spoke in your speech about productivity. You spoke about industrial relations, <coughs> small business, the enterprise bargaining system. Um, the Morrison government had a go at this a year or so ago, brought together unions, business, interested parties, and for reasons too extensive to mention now, it, it didn't really go far. But one of the constants you get from business, uh, business groups, about the enterprise bargaining system is to remove the better off overall test and go back to Paul Keating's no disadvantage test and the Keating IR reforms were one of the great productivity drivers of the modern era. You've been quite critical of any moves to touch the boot test during the campaign. Will you be flexible on that and prepared to entertain a, a more Keating-like uh, reform program if that's what it takes to get a result that the Morrison government couldn't? Paul Keating made work workers better off, not worse off. And you only remove the better off overall test if you don't want people to be better off overall. It's pretty simple, really. Uh, what you can have is, through genuine negotiation, improvements that increase both business profitability and wages. That's the Keating model. That's the Keating model, including uh, through the social wage that he did as well, that made people better off. Uh, our childcare plan is an example of something that will make people, families uh, better off. Uh, but uh, what occurred, to be clear about the government's uh, system, was that they had negotiations that were very constructive. They had negotiations with big business and unions. They had negotiations with small business. And, and I refer you to the, uh, the elements of my speech today about small business and unions and flexibility. Uh, there was great progress made and then the government came out with legislation that didn't reflect any of the negotiations that had taken place. I've had direct discussions with small business and with uh, the Business Council of Australia and other businesses, as well as with unions, about the prospect of uh, sincere, real change that provides win-win. I think we can get win-win with small business, but we can also get uh, wins uh, with larger businesses and unions as well. Uh, we have common interests. This has been a theme uh, well back, I've been speaking about, uh, for a very long period of time. You can't have union members if you don't have successful employers. And we have common interests here. Uh, business recognises it, unions recognise it. What they haven't had is a partner to bring people together. They'll have it under a Labor government I lead. Catherine Murphy. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Mr Albanese. Australia has recorded 5,633 COVID-related deaths this year. That's a, it equates to a seven-day average of 45 deaths a day. Scott Morrison said this morning the pandemic had passed. He said, we are, this is a quote, we're living with COVID and not going back to those daily press conferences of people talking about COVID every day and putting the threat of shutdowns or lockdowns in people's lives again. So my question is, what would an Albanese Labor government do to curb the death rate from COVID by way of a national strategy that Scott Morrison once prided himself on delivering? Thanks, Catherine. We do need to step up the national strategy. Uh, we need to look at not just the number of deaths, but also the number of people who are in hospital, but the number of infections which are there as well. Uh, because of uh, the uh, people going out and getting vaccinated, the impact on many people is less than it would have been if people were unvaccinated. But it's still a major issue. And uh, I have raised, as, as one of the things uh, that I would be seeking to do very early on, uh, as, in within, as in next week, uh, providing a comprehensive briefing uh, where I have asked as part of incoming briefs, uh, that there be exactly that, a national strategy. How do we get the information out there so people get their booster shots? Uh, what can we do to minimise the impact of COVID, which is continuing to have a, an ongoing uh, impact on people, sometimes to uh, people, not just uh, vulnerable people. There's a lot of uh, younger people 
uh, can have an impact as well, are, are in hospital. Uh, we need to uh, continue to be vigilant and recognise and recognise uh, that this pandemic is still having a real human impact. Peter Van Onselen. Peter Van Onselen for Network 10. Uh, at the start of this campaign, you stumbled on some of the economic figures. You haven't held an economic portfolio, handed down a budget or worked in business. With interest rates on the rise uh, and Australia needing to recover from the pandemic, is Scott Morrison right when he says that you're not up to the job? Uh, Scott Morrison is wrong. He's wrong in terms of his assessment that somehow infrastructure is not an economic portfolio. I'll, I'll make that point. But he's also wrong in terms of not understanding, not having a, a, a comprehension of what Australia needs to do. What I've done during this campaign is outline a plan for economic growth, a plan for investing in infrastructure, the MBN, childcare, making things here, our Powering Australia plan that would all, will all contribute uh, to economic growth and therefore contribute to future revenues, not just to current expenditures. That's been our focus. And this government uh, got through a 2019 campaign by saying, well, we're not the other side and running scare campaigns. This time round, I, I ask you this, there's a reason probably why Scott Morrison's not prepared to address the National Press Club. Uh, because uh, this government are continuing to, after four years of Scott Morrison's Prime Ministership, uh, he doesn't have an economic plan going forward. What he has is a bunch of scare campaigns, fear campaigns, misinformation and a Helped by, helped by some out there, it must be said, uh, in terms of the public debate. Uh, but we are putting forward a positive agenda uh, for the next term. Scott Morrison is not. He hasn't learned from the mistakes of the past. He struggles with the present and he has no plan for the future. Jonathan Kersley. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Mr Albanese. Jonathan Kersley from Nine News. Mr Albanese... Happy birthday for yesterday. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, can I ask you, do you promise to govern under the same set of standards you have set for the government in opposition? And if so, how would you achieve that? Uh, by being up front. By being up front, by putting in place, for a start, a National Anti-Corruption Commission would be a good idea. Um, we have... I think less confidence that I feel from the Australian public in the national government than uh, has been there for a long period of time. Uh, John Howard I had criticisms of. I had a lot of criticisms. But they didn't have the stench and the taint that this government has around it. John Howard, when ministers did the wrong thing, stood them down and stood them aside. These guys are a revolving door. Where they step down, like Stuart Robert or Susan Lay, they're back before you know it. Barnaby Joyce is back as Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, the truth is uh, that we need to build confidence in government and in the integrity of government. To do that, you need a National Anti-Corruption Commission, but you also, you also want to govern in a way that is far more transparent, far more open, one that accepts responsibility uh, for uh, the high office uh, that the Prime Minister and other ministers hold. Just on the first part of that question, though, do you, do you promise to govern under the same standards you have set in opposition? I, I, I promise to govern with integrity, to always be up front, uh, to be honest with people is, is what I do. Claire Armstrong. <clears throat> Claire Armstrong from the Daily Telegraph. Thank you, Mr Albanese. We've seen seismic changes in Parliament as a workplace <coughs> after the Women's March for Justice. If elected Prime Minister and you were made aware of a complaint about the behaviour of a member of your team, what would you do? Um, we, have, uh, we have processes in place uh, to ensure that our 
workplace in terms of the Labor Party is, uh, is a safe workplace. Uh, we have those processes were established by Bill Shorten to give credit where credit's due. Uh, but uh, we also strengthen them. And we did that with a process uh, led by uh, the women in our caucus, uh, Sharon Clayton in particular, our caucus chair, the involvement of every, every person in the caucus and also through the national executive. So that is a very clear process uh, that we have in place. Uh, that ensures confidentiality, that ensures that people can have the confidence to come forward. In addition to that, in terms of the parliament, uh, we have supported uh, the parliamentary processes uh, that have been uh, established and um, which have ensured, uh, I think they've got, well, I don't think, they have got support of uh, the entire parliament. Those changes that have been made are good and positive. Uh, in addition to that as well, we need to recognise that uh, every workplace needs to be a safer workplace and that's why I will adopt the 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report from Kate Jenkins. Uh, the government uh, responded to some of those uh, but they left out a critical one as well, which is the, the obligation on employers to do what they can uh, to have a safe workplace. But with respect, it's what, right, what would right. you do though? Would you refer someone to that process? Is that your answer? Well, we have processes in place, yes, absolutely. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Mr Albanese, you've spoken a lot in this campaign about growing the manufacturing centre, uh, sector. Spot prices in the wholesale gas market are soaring at the moment and local businesses are saying that the energy costs could force them to close. Last year, you backed a call from unions to invoke, uh, to urge Scott Morrison to invoke the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, which would effectively limit the amount of gas we send overseas to lower prices for our local firms. If you win on Saturday... And some of that's occurred. If you win on Saturday, will you pull the trigger on that mechanism? <laughs> well, well, what we know is that if you look at a state that has uh, made sure that its businesses have access uh, to gas, uh, go to WA where we were yesterday. Uh, it's been very successful. It's been very successful in WA. Uh, we will work uh, with industry uh, constructively uh, to make sure uh, that they can uh, continue to thrive. Uh, we think that in terms of manufacturing, there are enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities. And if you look at where this debate has gone in terms of power for industry. Remember there was a fellow called Josh Frydenberg he used to stand up and, and give speeches in Parliament about saving Liddell and Liddell staying open. Doesn't do it anymore and Liddell's closing on their watch. The changes that are occurring through uh, the, the, the energy market that are occurring that are driven by prices and by the market and where the cheapest form of new energies are, need to be, need to be uh, channelled, we need to work with them and that's what we will do uh, with businesses. I've sat down uh, with businesses, whether it be a, a company like Rio, for example, with their alumina uh, manufacturing. What are Rio doing just outside of Gladstone? They're looking at hydrogen. Uh, there are businesses that are responding. The truth is, that business is so far ahead of this government that they can't see where the government is. But just for what, short what term prices, though, do you support pulling the trigger? You still support what, pulling the trigger asking on the mechanism? What I might do down the track, but we would take advice the down the track. What we would do is work with business to provide investment certainty to make sure that we reduce energy costs for business. Uh, that is what we would do. Uh, and we would be, in terms of... Uh, mode neutral, our policy in terms of powering Australia is mode neutral in terms of where the market is going. This government have been like swimming against the tide and, and that is why uh, they haven't been successful. Andrew Clonell. <clears throat> Mr Albanese, you speak extensively about being the young man from the council flat and this is not an invitation to repeat that story. But from but these... I might anyway. Oh, please don't. <laughs> please don't. 
I'll answer now, that, part, I'll answer this, that part of the question. From this, at least, at least initially, you became an unreconstructed socialist. Would the young man in the council flat approve of the man here endorsing stage three tax cuts, which give people on more than 200 grand a tax cut of 10 grand? Or would the young man in the council flat approve of a family on 500K getting a 26K childcare subsidy? Aren't you just endorsing this tax cuts policy to win the election? And won't you change your mind afterwards blaming economic circumstances? And what can we see in your October budget? Could we see an aged care levy? Could we see an increase in the Medicare levy? The young lad in the council flat, <laughs> and I'll begin there, <laughs> had a mum who told that young man that he could be anything he wanted to be. When I speak about no one left behind and no one held back. No one left behind is about protecting the disadvantaged. That's why I don't support a real wage cut for people on minimum wages. That's why. Simple as that. That's why I say that each and every budget, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister sitting here, I'll say to them, what can we do for people who are doing it tough? Each and every budget. I'll come to you. It's answer. about... Yeah. I'll come to you, answer. That is a part of my mantra I've held my whole life. But the other thing about no one held back is people aspiring uh, to a better life. That's what Labor does. One of the things about this campaign is that, um, you know, some people say, oh, there's a change in the, the political dynamic out there, right? One of the reasons why there's a change in the political dynamic out there compared with when I was a young man, is that Labor governments mean that, hands up here, my colleagues who are the first person in their family to go to university. That's what's happened. Labor governments give people the opportunity to get ahead. I want businesses to be successful. I want people to have the certainty of knowing what their income will be which is why I argued for and Labor, Labor supported, supported, we, we had amendments there, but once they, they were not successful, uh, we voted for the legislation of the tax cuts and we said clearly and explicitly we would keep those legislated tax cuts because people deserve that certainty going forward. But what we'll also do is craft a whole agenda for how you grow the economy. We're missing out at the moment. And in today's globalised world, if you're standing still, the rest of the world is just going past you. We're in the fastest growing region of the world in human history to our north. We have incredible opportunities. If you look at uh, what I've done, and some of my views of course have changed. When facts change, change your views as you learn each and every day in this job. I've developed, I believe, I have as good a relations with the business community as anyone in the parliament, at least as good. I challenge anyone to say they have more. Does that mean I always agree with them? No. But what it means is when I say something, I deliver it. And if you ask anyone who has dealt with me, and one of the reasons I think why, that young, young lad from the council flat became the leader of the Australian Labor Party unopposed as because my entire political career has been built on my word. Yeah, on just my quickly. Word. No, no, sorry. No new Andrew. taxes. No. Is that what you're saying? Sorry, Andrew. Sit down. Andrew. <laughs> Anna. Anna Henderson. No new taxes. <laughs> We'll do exactly what I have said we would do. And one of those, Andrew must have missed it, is the multinational tax. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. Hey, Anna. The Prime Minister says you would be a weak leader on the international stage. <laughs> and SBS has spoken to Chinese diplomatic sources who say that whichever party is elected, they will seek fresh talks on some level. So is China to be trusted or is China the enemy? And if you are elected, will you pick up the phone to President Xi? 
Uh, China has changed its position under Xi. Uh, Xi, of course, came and addressed the National Parliament, welcomed by Tony Abbott with some rather uh, effusive comments uh, at that time. Uh, Australia has had to uh, adjust to that. And I think that the relationship between Australia and China uh, will remain a challenging one, regardless of who wins the election. But I'll tell you what I will do if I have the great honour of leading this country. Uh, I will cherish relationships uh, that I build, uh, including uh, reacquainting myself with President Biden uh, next week if, if we're successful. Uh, what we've seen is a whole series of Australia's international relations being, uh, being damaged. You know what weak is? Weak is leaking a private text message with an ally. That's weak. That's what that is, because you're under pressure. You've got a bad headline, oh, well, just chuck this out, and then say, oh, I don't know where that came from. I'll tell you what weak is, being asked being asked to consult across the parliament and ensure that there's bipartisan support for AUKUS with the party, with the party, my party, that is responsible for the foundations of the US alliance forged under John Curtin, and then misleading that ally about whether that consultation has taken place. That's weak. That's Would you weak. you pick up the phone, Mr Albany? That's weak. That's weak. What I'll do... My, the first thing I'll be doing is meeting with our allies. That's what I'll be doing. Meeting with President Biden, meeting with Prime Minister Kushida, meeting with Narendra Modi uh, next week. That's my priority. Now, we've got time for quite a few more questions, but nobody's actually asked you about costing, so I'm just going to intervene here. <laughs> um, you, you've no, they, they, they wait. I, I got 18 questions yesterday, but they'll wait to chase. Well, um, well you've, you've had 11 so far. So my, my question to you is... It's all about the drama, Laura. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, so the, the question is, you, you've said you're just doing what uh, the, uh, the Coalition did in 2010 and 2013, which was basically pretty low grade. Um, but more importantly, back in the day, politicians for a while, political parties for a while, actually released costings of individual policies as they went. Now, Which we have. Late, but really detailed policies over four years, you know, number by number, that, that seems to have declined. You're talking about greater accountability and transparency. Are you committing also to, you know, bringing some of those standards back? Has the Charter of Budget Honesty become a bit of an excuse for not being more transparent? Um, we have released, with every policy, with every single policy we've released, how much it would cost over the forward estimates as we've gone on. Every day I have stood up and in the media releases uh, there has been costings. Uh, this is a government that spent $70 billion between my EFO in December and March. $70 billion without a single offset. This is a government that made a $60 billion error in the costing of its JobKeeper program. This is a government that is the most wasteful government in Australian political history. And that is why we have said up front that the Department of Treasury and the Department of Finance will go through the accounts line by line and try to find where some of this waste and rorts are. Laura, th this, is a, this is a government that have previously, all, all governments have had very small uh, amounts in the contingency reserve. Contingency reserve is there because it's a contingency. What this government has used is the creation of multiple funds, multiple funds, in order to just rort taxpayers' money. They treat taxpayers' money like Liberal Party money. Uh, they have. Barnaby Joyce, who knows what he has promised uh, around the country out of some secret deal. You know, when we go to transparency, there is a deal between the coalition, a written deal between the Liberal Party and the National Party on the basis of the formation of the Government of Australia that no one's allowed to know what's in it. No one's allowed to know what's in it. We have been transparent the whole way along. We are releasing 
our costings uh, tomorrow. Uh, I had some detail today, which I flagged yesterday in one of the 18 questions I took at a media conference yesterday. I flagged that I would have more to say today about our costings, because I respect the National Press Club and always have a couple of announcements here. And today's return to budget of three quarters of a billion dollars is a costing announcement that we scheduled to make today. So we'll have all of our costings out there uh, tomorrow. Uh, but we have been extraordinarily transparent the whole way through. You know what the government's been after? A desperate government that doesn't want to discuss the fact that wages are going back by record levels, a desperate government that doesn't want to discuss, they're not talking about this anymore, the $1, if you increase wages by $1, the sky will fall in. Last time round, if you had electric vehicles at the end of the weekend and if you acted on climate change, the sky will fall in. This government, this government are the least transparent, least open, least fair income government in Australian political history. They've spent a billion dollars on advertising themselves, including, including how good they are on climate. There's a savings for you as well. And $3 billion that we've put out there, $3 billion on labour hire, on contracting out. And you know what they did yesterday? Yesterday, they stood up and said, we're gonna gut the public service even more. Well, you know what that leads to? Robo debt. It doesn't save money, it costs money, because you take humans out of human services and it has devastating consequences. For real people, it costs lives. Lives, as well as over a billion dollars to taxpayers. So all of this nonsense about costings, we will be fair income as we have been the whole way through. But what you won't see from us is the waste and the rorts. It's got to end. It's got to end and we've got to prioritise growing the economy and productivity. Nani Scar. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Lani Scar from the West Australian. Mr Albanese, thank you for your speech. Generally in Australia, a woman is murdered by her current or former partner every nine days. We've seen a woman murdered every week during the election campaign, so it wouldn't be surprising if before we know the result of the election, another woman is dead. The draft national plan on women's safety has a target of halving that number of deaths. When will we see that number halved or reduced even more than that if you're elected Prime Minister on Saturday? Thanks, Lani. Um, I think from, from memory, the, uh, the number of women uh, who died last year was 43. So one every nine days, it's almost one a week. Um, we, we, we want that to be reduced to zero is the ideal, obviously. Um, it, is, it is a tragedy that too many women and their children uh, live with, with domestic and family violence, and that, tragically, uh, that can lead to uh, murder, call it for what it is, uh, by uh, a partner or by a former partner. Uh, we need, I think, to really put the whole nation... Government can't do this alone, of course. Uh, government needs to work with uh, civil society uh, to call this out for uh, what it is. Uh, We've put forward some really practical uh, options as well. One of them is, I, I announced today, another of the announcements today, uh, again reiterating our view that 10 days family and domestic violence leave uh, should be law in this country. Uh, if, if, if women are faced with uh, having to continue uh, to work or worried about putting food on the table, then it leaves them more vulnerable. The other thing that we need to do is to make sure that uh, women and children escaping domestic violence have somewhere to go. And that's why our Housing Australia Future Plan has 4,000 uh, of, uh, of those homes, 20,000, uh, reserved for women and children escaping domestic violence. 
It's why we have $100 million allocated for emergency housing. Tonight, we know, because every night it happens, a woman and perhaps a, a, a woman with children will be turned away from a shelter because there simply isn't room. They'll be forced to sleep in their car or they'll sleep in a park or they'll sleep on a friend's couch or worse still, they'll return to a violent situation. We need to do much better than that. And uh, I am committed and I, I believe a, a government, certainly that I lead, uh, will be absolutely committed to doing what we can uh, to reduce uh, the numbers of uh, women uh, in terms of fatalities, murders, but also to reduce uh, domestic and family violence across the Would board. Would that number be halved uh, by the end no, of your look, first sorry, term? Sorry, Lani, we've, we've basically running out of time here. I'm sorry, we've been sure. firm here. You've got time for two more questions. Um, thank um, you. Uh, yep. <laughs> Ben, ben Westcott. Thank you very much. Uh, ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Um, thank you for your speech, Mr Albanese. Uh, if you become Prime Minister on Saturday, you'll be handing off to Tokyo for the Quad meeting pretty soon afterwards. And you've spoken today about your uh, three pillars for foreign policy. Something else you've mentioned is that uh, if it wasn't for Japan, your first visit overseas would be to Indonesia. Uh, now, obviously, these first visits can be quite symbolic. Uh, I was interested, what in particular would you be looking to get through your first visit to Indonesia? What specific changes are you looking to make in the relationship? And would you want a closer security partnership with Indonesia? Uh, Indonesia is a really important partner for Australia. Uh, that has been the case for a number of decades and as, as, as a minister in the former government, I went to Indonesia more than, than any other country. Uh, we developed a, a program called ITSAP, the um, Indonesian Transport Safety Assistance Package. Um, I think that we need to develop much closer relationships with many of the, the, the partners in our region and uh, Penny Wong has, uh, as, uh, as our foreign shadow, has made some significant announcements about how we would deal uh, with uh, countries uh, to our north. Um, I, I would intend uh, for Indonesia to be uh, the next uh, visit uh, after the Quad Leaders meeting um, and uh, for that to happen uh, as soon as possible uh, to be organised. Uh, Indonesia is uh, will grow to be an economy that's, uh, that's substantial in the world. We, we live in a region whereby in the future we will have uh, China, India and Indonesia as giants. We need to strengthen that economic partnership and one way that we can do that is by strengthening people-to-people -people relations as well. Uh, Indonesia is an important nation uh, for our economy, uh, for those social uh, relationships as well. I want to see uh, more engagement uh, and, and that cross work, uh, us assisting in areas in, that they need. I did that as a minister in government and I know that it was really uh, appreciated. There, there would be in, in areas like maritime safety, for example, uh, AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, have done extraordinary work and indeed have brought uh, Indonesian uh, maritime safety experts to, to here in Canberra. It's based in Canberra. And that, that dialogue has strengthened the relationship. It's one of the things that I, I had the opportunity to learn when travelling uh, as, uh, as an Australian representative. I was in India leading a, a delegation just uh, a, a few years ago. It was well in 2018 and we launched there the Australia-India Alumni Association. That's really strong. Why is it that Indonesia is so close, about to be a superpower in the world? Uh, we need to really strengthen the relationship with Indonesia and that's why it would be an absolute priority for me. Thank you. The last question is from Andrew Brown. Andrew Brown from AAP Newswire. Throughout this whole campaign, Labor and yourself have been advocating for a rise in wages to help keep up with inflation and help keep up um, with the rising cost of living and yet you've only promised a review to increase pensions. So don't welfare recipients and those on those payments deserve an increase, and do they deserve the same level of advocacy from Labor? What I've said um, consistently is that uh, you, 
you actually don't need a review to know that someone who's on the pension is doing it tough at the moment. We know that. And every time a budget is handed down, we will consider what we can do uh, for pensioners and for uh, people on job seeker as well. Um, I, I make this point. The largest increase in the pensions in Australia's history happened the last time we were in government with Jenny Macklin as uh, the minister and Wayne Swan as the treasurer. Uh, I was very proud of that and we will do, we will do uh, what we can within the fiscal constraints. Uh, one of the things we have though in, in the fiscal circumstances we will inherit is a trillion dollars of debt, a trillion dollars of debt whereby uh, people who, who are on minimum wages are going backwards and today we saw a, a, a significant a thud in the gap between wages and inflation today. So we do need to address that. And, and when asked, um, you know, would I support the Fair Work Commission if it comes out with the finding that someone on $20.33 deserves an extra dollar? Absolutely. I could have added some adjectives there, but I didn't. <laughs> but I didn't because I know how tough people are doing it and it stands in stark contrast with the other bloke. They've stopped talking about it. Have you noticed that? Stopped talking about it in the last few days and now they're trying to talk about uh, other issues as well. They want to raid people's wages, now they want to raid people's super. Uh, the truth is that people out there who are doing it tough uh, do need a government that is on their side. I'll be on their side. Scott Morrison is on his own side. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes.